Now, we shall talk about the RDNA technology which is placed under the applied biology unit here now. The RDNA technology, the manipulation of genetic material of an organism either by addition of genes or deletion of genes is called RDNA technology. Manipulation of genetic material of an organism either by addition of genes or deletion of genes okay, uh, is called RDNA technology. Here, the RDNA technology, the most important aspect, you know, which is important MZ point of view and comet case one and so forth, you know. The preparation of insulin in the lab by using RDNA technology, you know. The insulin that is extracted from animal tissues, that is from the pancreas of the slaughterhouse, you know, it turns out to be very expensive and it is not much accessible, you know, it is not stable and you do not get large quantity of insulin from slaughterhouse pancreas you know. So, to avoid all these uh, discrepancies you know, nowadays insulin is prepared in the biotechnology lab by using the principle of RDNA technology you know. You know very well the students insulin is secreted by beta cells of the pancreas. It is a dipolypeptide hormone you know, it has got A chain and A polypeptide chain a polypeptide chain and B polypeptide chain, they can be called alpha chain or beta chain, polypeptide chain here now. A chain contains 21 amino acids, B chain contains 30 amino acids, that is altogether it has got 51 amino acids here now. I know very well insulin is a glycogenetic hormone, it is a glycogenetic hormone that is it facilitates conversion of glucose into glycogen. The main objective of insulin is to lower blood glucose level. It lowers blood glucose level by converting excess glucose into glycogen or by stimulating the tissue so that they make use of glucose present in the blood. Since it lowers blood glucose level it is also called hypoglycemic hormone. It is also called hypoglycemic hormone. This hormonal therapy is used for both diabetes mellitus that is both the disorders of diabetes mellitus, mellitus 1, mellitus 2. Mellitus 1 is called insulin dependent diabetes mellitus, idim and mellitus 2 is non-insulin dependent diabetes mellitus that is nidim here now. Both the cases there is a large scale usage of insulin hormone here now. So, this is commonly called glycogenetic hormone or hypoglycemic hormone here now. So, in order to extract this hormone here now, you need to have a okay, DNA sequences here now. Eli Lilly, Eli Lilly is an American, American company here now that has come forward to synthesize insulin here now by using our DNA technology. Eli Lilly Institute has prepared two DNA sequences here now, two DNA sequences in the lab by using polynucleotides that is beta uh, DNA sequence and alpha insulin sequence. Both alpha and beta DNA sequences are introduced into the plasmid of E. coli bacterium, plasmid of E. coli bacterium. Then within the E. coli, those DNA sequences here now synthesize insulin. The insulin is extracted separately from the E. coli bacteria. Later on, these two polypeptide strands have got another extra strand called C peptide, extra starch it is, an extra starch called extra starch called C peptide here now. So, the C peptide the two both the polypeptide chains along with the C peptide is called pro-insulin which is not very effective. So, in the lab the C peptide is separated. Later on both the polypeptide chains are now are connected to each other by disulfide bonds, connected to each other by disulfide bonds so that it becomes an efficient insulin hormone here now. Now, the hormone why is this being prepared, preferred here now over the hormone that is extracted from animal tissue? The hormone that is extracted from animal tissue is not much accessible number one. The preparation of hormone from animal tissue turns out to be very expensive number two. 
Number three, it is not much stable here now. Gets denatured within a short period. Number four, it has got an extra non-self proteins. You know, additional non-self proteins are there in the insulin that is prepared from the animal tissue. And when such insulin is given to the patient, say now, it causes certain allergic reactions. So to avoid all this, say now, of late, insulin is being prepared in the biotechnology lab by using the rdna technology you know where you are getting alpha chain and beta chain separately along with that there is a c peptide c peptide is separated so that pro insulin gets converted into active insulin and later on this active insulin both the strands are connected to each other by disulfide bonds so alpha and beta both of them are connected to each other by disulfide bonds you know so is one of the breakthrough methods in the RDNA technology that is preparation of insulin here now. The insulin that is prepared by RDNA technology is called homulin. Insulin that is prepared by RDNA technology called homulin. Now we shall talk about the plasmid here now. Once these uh, DNA sequences are introduced into the plasmid, the plasmid has to be inserted into the host animal, maybe E. coli bacteria or some other host here now. Several methods are adapted to introduce R plasmid that is recombinant plasmid into the host. Now R plasmids are introduced into the host by several methods. First one is called transfection method. Transfection is mostly adapted uh, in case of the animal tissues that when the plasmid is introduced into the animal tissues or E. coli bacteria, so on and so forth, it is called transfection method. And number two, transduction method. Transduction method, that is, if uh, lambda phase, uh, lambda phase viruses, you know, are used to introduce plasmid into the host cells, you know, it is called transduction method, that is viral vectors. If viral vectors are used, lambda phase virus, okay, so on and so forth, you know, if viral vectors are used to introduce plasmid into the host cells, it is called transduction method here now. Then the another one called electroporation method. In electroporation, electroporation here now, certain buffer solutions are used here now. Mostly preferably the phosphate buffer solutions are used here now for introducing the plasmid into the host cells. For instance, you take uh, the bacteria, Escherichia coli bacteria where you want to introduce here now R plasmids into the Escherichia coli. The, pla uh, the Escherichia coli bacteria are placed in a suspension of phosphate buffers so that the phosphate buffers make uh, perforations in the outer wall of the bacterial cell. Uh, as a result of that, the, bac the plasmids can easily okay, penetrate into the bacteria through the perforations. You know. So the method of introducing plasmids into the bacteria by keeping those bacteria in a suspension of phosphate buffers is called electroporation. Then you have another one called gene gun method. Gene gun method. It is also called biolistic method. Gene gun is an equipment here now coated with gold plate. It is used to introduce the plasmids into the host animals here now where the R plasmids are first made to stick to that gold plated coating here now. Later on that instrument is bombarded with the host cells so that the plasmids by themselves forcibly enter into the host cells here now. Okay. Then in uh, plants here now, TA plasmids are mostly used to introduce R plasmids into the plant tissues here now. So the most commonly used vector in case of plant tissue is tumor inducing plasmid you know TA plasmid you call it tumor inducing plasmid. So this plasmid is invariably used in the plant tissues you know to introduce RDNA R into the host cells. Okay, RDNA is present first introduced into the plasmid later on that plasmid is introduced into host cells. So in the host cells the plasmid synthesizes the biological product of your interest you know. Then while introducing the therapeutic DNA into the host cells you now, in order to protect the therapeutic DNA from external factors you now, sometimes they are coated with uh, certain lipids you now, which are called lipoplexis. 
if they are coated with certain lipid, you call a lipoplexus, you know. Sometimes the DNA, therapeutic DNA is coated with certain polymers so that the DNA does not get denatured while being introduced into the host cells. And if those polymers are used, they are called polyplexus. The polymers that are used to smear the entire DNA, okay, called polyplexus or sometimes synthetic, certain synthetic oligo di nucleosides synthetic oligo di nucleosides are used to silence the genes of the therapeutic dna so for the time being for a short period of time here now till they are introduced into the host cell they are made inactive by using this for silencing the genes here now later on once the dna is introduced into the host cell the genes become active and they start synthesizing the product of your interest here you now. So, apart from using different kinds of vectors here you now, lipoplexus, polyplexus and synthetic oligodinucleosides are also used here you now to protect the therapeutic DNA from external factors. The one more uh, advanced technology of RDNA technology is PCR technology. Polymerase chain reaction technology. This polymerase chain reaction technology is also called DNA amplification. This DNA amplification or PCR technology is used in the biotechnology lab to diagnose various diseases you know. It is mainly used to amplify the DNA of your interest you know. And this is also used as a tool in the biotechnology labs you know to diagnose certain disorders like AIDS. Hepatitis, cancer, different types of cancers can be diagnosed by using this. Then uh, PKU, phenylketonuria, a metabolic genetic disorder, PKU is also diagnosed by using this here now. Then hemophilia is also diagnosed by using this technology. And cystic fibrosa, cystic fibrosa, which is also a metabolic genetic disorder. They are all here now diagnosed by using PCR technology, polymerase chain reaction technology, which is also called DNA amplification. Transgenic animals here now, the animals that carry the genome of other organisms you know besides their own genome are called transgenic animals. Apart from their own genome, if they carry the genome of other organisms, such organisms can be called transgenic animals you know. In transgenic animals, the therapeutic gene that is the gene of your interest you know is introduced into the animals, okay, the test animals you know with the help of a plasmid, okay. Then later on that plasmid here you now delivers that particular unloads or delivers the gene of your interest into the cells of the uh, animals so that they become transgenic you know. Now transgenic technology is carried out in two methods you know. The first one is gene line therapy you call it. The transgenic animals you know are used in the lab for various purposes you know. They are used number one to, to study about the physiology of physiology and development of therapeutic genes, okay. The gene of your interest here now, how it works out, how it is responsible for a particular disorder, all that can be studied here now by using transgenic animals. Like for instance, you know, you take uh, growth hormone, the gene that is responsible for the formation of growth hormone here now. When it, when it introduced into the transgenic animal here now, how it promotes the growth, how it uh, induces the formation of insulin like growth factors, all that can be studied by introducing therapeutic genes here now into the transgenic animals here now. So the main objective of using transgenic animals is to study the physiology and development of transgenic genes. Number two, disease causing genes here now how these different kinds of deleterious genes, how they cause diseases you know, genetic disorders and different kinds of disorders you know, that can be studied by introducing those deleterious genes 
into the transgenic animals in in vivo condition here now. The next number 3, the transgenic animals are also used to synthesize certain biological products you know. Synthesize certain biological products. They are also used to synthesize certain biological products you know. Okay, the gene of your inter in interest or which has therapeutic value, it is introduced into the transgenic animal. The transgenic animals in turn synthesize the biological products which have got medicinal value you know are used for various purposes in the medical field. Like for instance you know alpha antitrypsin, alpha antitrypsin that is extracted from the transgenic animals is used to cure penile ketonuria cystic fibrosa. It is used to cure phenyl ketonuria and cystic fibrosa you know. That particular product which is extracted from transgenic animals is used to cure phenyl ketonuria and cystic fibrosa. In the same way, okay, from a, a transgenic animal called rosy, from a transgenic animal called rosy, milk is extracted, the milk that is rich in alpha lactoglobulin here you now, alpha lactoglobulin and alpha lactoalbumin. The milk that is extracted from rosy which is a transgenic animal is rich in alpha lactoglobulin and alpha lactoalbumin here you now. So, like that the transgenic animals are used to extract different kinds of biological products you know. Transgenic animals are also used here you now to study about the safety of the vaccines you know. Safety of vaccines. That is after preparation of the vaccine here you now, after formulation of the vaccine, how best it works in the human being here you now, whether it has got any kind of side effects or not, all that can be studied here you now by introducing the vaccines into transgenic animals here you now. So, vaccine safety also can be studied here you now by using transgenic animals here you now. Then transgenic animals are also used here you now to study about uh, the drug toxicity here you now drug toxicity like after preparation of the drug you know how it works how best it works you know in human being how it cures the disease you know what are the side effects that the drug is going to cause you know all those can be studied by using transgenic animals. Then apart from this transgenic animals one of the most important applications of transgenic animals is different kinds of proteins are extracted from their blood plasma from their uh, silamic fluid, from their cerebrospinal fluid, from their lymph, some, from time, sometimes from their urine, different kinds of proteins are extracted and those proteins in the pharmaceutical labs are used for preparation of different kinds of medicines you know, medicines that are used to cure different kinds of diseases. Instead of preparation of different kinds of medicines by extracting the proteins of transgenic animals is called micro farming, is called micro farming. So, this is the most important concept dear students you know this can be asked in M MZ, JIPMAR, AIMS, okay, Comet case one and so forth. So, micro farming is one of the most important advantages of transgenic animals you know where the proteins that are extracted from their urine, from their plasma, from their blood, from their cerebrospinal fluid are used for preparation of different kinds of medicines or drugs you know in the pharmaceutical labs. So, these are some of the advantages of transgenic animals you know. Gene therapy is one more biotechnology process you know which is used on a large scale you know to cure different kinds of diseases. What does it imply you know replacement of a defective gene by a normal gene can be called gene therapy. Now, it is carried out number one germline therapy, germline therapy, number 2 somatic line therapy you know, somatic line therapy. Germline therapy the gene of your interest you know therapeutic gene is extracted from, from various sources or it may be prepared in the lab by using certain synthetic oligonucleotides. Now, that therapeutic gene is introduced into a plasmid. 
the later on that plasmid is in turn introduced into either sperm or ova you know introduced into the sperm or ova so that when they get fertilized you know it is transferred to the zygote from zygote it is transferred to the the animal you know so that method of introducing the therapeutic gene into an organism through gametes is called germ line therapy which is uh, hereditary you know that is from the gametes it is transferred to the uh, adult organism from adult to once again gametes you know then somatic line therapy you know in somatic line therapy the therapeutic gene is introduced into the somatic cells you know of the body you know it can be carried out either in vivo condition or ex vivo condition you know that is called somatic line therapy and it is not hereditary you know and the first clinical therapy of gene line technology that is gene therapy technology is curing sid curing the sid by using the gene therapy you know severe combined immune deficient disorder it is a disorder where the infant right from the birth is deprived of both t lymphocytes and b lymphocytes it is a genetic metabolic disorder you know genetic disorder a congenital disorder you know notice right from the birth and it is due to mutation of the gene which is responsible for the formation of an enzyme called ada an enzyme called ada adenosin adenosin d aminase adenosin d aminase this enzyme okay the gene in turn synthesizes an enzyme this this is a gene here now the gene in turn synthesizes an enzyme and that enzyme is responsible for the formation of both b lymphocytes and t lymphocytes sometimes this ada gene undergoes mutation consequently the enzyme is not synthesized so as a result of that the child is child who is suffering from this disorder is deprived of both t lymphocytes and b lymphocytes where in in case of this okay death becomes imminent you know because once a child is deprived of both b and t he becomes susceptible to different kinds of infections you know so it may lead to death you know then how is it cured by using gene line therapy or gene therapy you know the ada first the c dna ada is prepared c dna ada gene is prepared in the lab okay the complementary dna ADA gene is prepared in the lab here now okay by using the principles of biotechnology later on this particular gene is introduced into the retrovirus plasmid retrovirus plasmid this particular virus plasmid is used to introduce this now this retrovirus plasmid is in turn introduced into lymphocytes lymphocytes and these lymphocytes are given to the sid patient at regular intervals you know okay so this gene is prepared this gene through retroviral plasmid is introduced into the lymphocytes and those lymphocytes are given to the child who is suffering from this particular disorder at regular intervals but this process has to be taken up at regular intervals because lymphocytes have got only short life span you know so this is not a uh, 100% uh, okay curative method for the gene therapy you know then instead of this you know what is the best method to get rid of this seed you know the gene the cdna ada gene has to be introduced into the child in the fetal stage itself okay before the del uh, delivery in the fetal stage itself it has to be diagnosed by using pcr technology later on that gene is introduced in the fetal stage itself so that the child can overcome that particular seed you know so that is one of the advantages of the gene therapy technology you know now we shall talk about stem cells you know the undifferentiated cells present in the human body which can differentiate to form different types of organs can be called stem cells you know now the stem cells on the basis of their rate of proliferation the ability to form various organs they are divided into different types you know like to start with first you have totipotent cell which is also called omnipotent the cells which are capable of so stem cells you know there are different types of stem cells 
starting with the first one here now that is totipotent cells are omnipotent. The cells which are capable of forming the entire embryo can be called totipotent cells. Mostly the marula stage can be called totipotent or the blastocyst can be called totipotent. So, they can differentiate, it can differentiate to form the entire organism. So, such cells are called totipotent or omnipotent. Now, this totipotent in turn will give rise to pluripotent cells. The cells which are capable of forming most of the organs can be called pluripotent like uh, the epiblast, epiblast present in the inner cell mass, present in the inner cell mass of blastocyst is an example for pluripotent. The epiblast, are, the epiblast is the after the formation of hypoblast, the remaining cells of the embryonal knob can be called epiblast here now. This epiblast is capable of forming all the three primary germ layers ectoderm, endoderm and mesoderm. So, it is the best example for pluripotent cells and most of the pluripotent cells are self renewing cells, self renewing cells that is when they differentiate one cell always remains undifferentiated and other cell keeps on dividing to form different kinds of cells you know, so that they never get exhausted in the human body you know. Such cells are called self renewing cells you know. So, pluripotent cells are self renewing cells. Now, this pluripotent in turn will multiply to form multipotent cells you know. These multipotent cells are also self renewing cells and they differentiate to form cells of the same family you know. Cells that belong to a particular organ or a particular tissue are obtained from multipotent cells. Hemopoietic stem cells is the best example. Hemopoietic stem cells okay, are the multipotent cells in the human body. You know. Then multipotent in turn will divide to form unipotent cells. That is a cell which can form only one kind of cell you know, or one kind of okay, organ or a tissue can be called unipotent cell. So, on the basis of their ability to form various organs you now, the stem cells are divided into totipotent, number 1, number 2 pluripotent, number 3 multipotent, number 4 unipotent cells you now. Stem cells you now, they are further divided into two types, embryonic stem cells and adult stem cells. The embryonic stem cells you now, present in the embryonic stage can be called embryonic stem cells like epiblast is the best example for the embryonic stem cells which are pluripotent, multipotent, they give rise to the primary germ layers and nearly 200 kinds of cells you know. The embryonic stem cells are always self renewing cells you know. Then the cells present in the adults are called adult stem cells you know. The adult stem cells are confined to only certain organs of the body like mesenchymal cells mesenchymal cells of liver, adipocyte stem cells, adipocyte stem cells, epithelial stem cells, epithelial stem cells, then next you have uh, satellite cells, satellite cells are the undifferentiated cells present in the skeletal muscles. They are responsible for regeneration of the skeletal muscles whenever they are damaged, you know. Then pericytes are also a kind of stem cells, you know. They are present in non striated muscles. They are also responsible for regeneration of the smooth muscles, you know. Okay. So, these are some of the examples for adult stem cells, mesenchymal cells of liver, adipocyte stem cells, epithelial stem cells, satellite cells of striated muscles pericytes of non striated muscles you know. Okay, and even hemopoietic cells also come under hemopoietic cells also come under adult stem cells you know. Now, we shall talk about the hemopoietic cells in detail you know.
the cells present in the bone marrow are called hemopoietic stem cells they are self renewing cells self renewing cells and uh, they are also called primary stem cells primary stem cells okay now these hemopoietic stem cells which are self renewing and primary stem cells they differentiate to form two kinds of secondary stem cells the secondary stem cells are also called common progenitors they are also called common progenitors they differentiate to form myeloid stem cells and lymphoid stem cells so here yeah, hemopoietic stem cells are the primary stem cells you know they are self renewing cells they differentiate to form two kinds of secondary stem cells which are also called common progenitors there are two types of secondary stem cells myeloid stem cells and lymphoid stem cells you know now these myeloid stem cells in turn differentiate to form committed progenitors in turn differentiate to form committed progenitors that is common progenitors differentiate to form committed progenitors what are they under this you have number 1 erythroid committed progenitors erythroid committed progenitors these erythroid committed progenitors are also called pro erythroblasts pro erythroblasts these pro erythroblasts you now proliferate rapidly pass through several intermediate stages to form rbcs you know they are released into the blood stream at reticulocyte stage reticulocyte stage on entering the blood stream it sheds off that reticular network of chromatin material and finally transforms into rbc you know so erythroid committed progenitors number 2 basophilic committed progenitors basophilic committed progenitors which give rise to basophils number 3 eosinophilic committed progenitors eosinophilic committed progenitors which differentiate to form eosinophils number 4 dendritic cells dendritic cells dendritic cells are the committed progenitors present in the central nervous system they mostly act as antigen presenting cells they act as apcs antigen presenting cells apcs the next you have gm committed that is granulocyte granulocyte monocyte committed progenitors monocyte committed progenitors gm progenitors you call them granulocyte monocyte committed progenitors these granulocyte monocyte committed progenitors differentiate to form neutrophils on one hand and monocyte on the other hand okay they differentiate to form neutrophils and monocytes okay you have erythroid committed progenitors basophilic committed progenitors eosinophilic committed progenitors dendritic cells and gm committed progenitors and the sixth one is megalocyte committed progenitors this megalocyte committed progenitors differentiate to form platelets you know so all of them are derived from the myeloid stem cells which are also called secondary stem cells and moving to this side here now lymphoid committed progenitors which are the secondary stem cells are common progenitors they differentiate to form number 1 dendritic cells number 2 nk cells natural killer cells which are also called lgl large granular lymphocytes number 3 basophilic committed progen number 3 b lymphocyte committed progenitors
which differentiate to form B lymphocytes and now immune competent B lymphocytes and functional B lymphocytes. The next you have fourth one T lymphocyte committed progenitors. T lymphocyte committed progenitors. These T lymphocyte committed progenitors are obtained from the red bone marrow. They come out of the red bone marrow, enter thymus, in thymus gland they transform into immune competent T lymphocytes or mature T lymphocytes. They come out of the thymus and enter secondary lymphoid organs. In se secondary lymphoid organs, these immune competent T cells transform into functional T cells you now. Then functional T cells are of basically two types you now, helper T lymphocytic cells which carry CD4 markers and uh, cytotoxic T lymphocytic cells which carry CD8 markers you know. So, they are all the cells that are obtained from T lymphocytic committed progenitors. So, from lymphoid committed progenitors you now, lymphoid common progenitors differentiate into number 1 dendritic cell, number 2 NK cell, number 3 B lymphocytic committed progenitor, number 4 T lymphocytic committed progenitors. So, they are all the stem cells you now which belong to hemopoietic stem cell category you now. The research in the stem cell okay, mechanism was conducted by Thompson. Research in the stem cell was conducted by Thompson here now. Now, the stem cells are nowadays being used to cure various disorders like Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, certain neural disorders here now can be cured by means of stem cells here now. Apart from that, nowadays they are being used here now even uh, to, to implant uh, hair in the baldness you know, so on and so forth. They have got wider application in the medical field here you now. Now, the vaccines were discovered by Edward Jenna. He discovered smallpox vaccine for the first time, smallpox vaccine for the first time here now. The method of attenuation of organisms that is making the microorganisms inactive, the phenomena of making the microorganisms inactive or the process of attenuation was discovered by Louis Pasteur. Louis Pasteur discovered the phenomena of attenuation. Attenuation here. Now, there are different kinds of vaccines. The most important types of vaccines I'll, I shall put before you. First one you have attenuated attenuated vaccines, you know. Attenuated vaccines that is microorganisms from the pathogens are collected. They are thoroughly made inactive in the lab here now. Such inactivated microorganisms are called attenuated microorganisms. Those attenuated microorganisms are given to the human being in the form of a vaccine here now. But however, the first dose may not introduce sufficient number of antibodies here now. In order to introduce or in order to facilitate formation of sufficient number of antibodies here now, the vaccines are given at regular intervals here now. The vaccine that is given at the first stage here now is called priming vaccine or priming dose here now and subsequent doses are called booster doses you know. Attenuated vaccines are used to cure rubella, measles, mumps and yellow fever. So, the vaccines which are used as a prophylactic measure for all these disorders like rubella, measles, mumps and yellow fever belong to attenuated vaccines you know. Second category is inactivated inactivated microorganism vaccines you know. Inactivated micro in this particular process you know the pathogens are collected from microorganisms and they are killed outright in the lab you know. Later on, the dead microorganisms are given to the human being in the form of an antigen to induce the formation of antibodies, you know. So, such dead microorganisms, if they are given in the form of vaccine, you call them inactivated microorganism vaccine, you know. If uh, the, that the, micro which are <coughs> the microorganisms which are thoroughly made inactive, they are called attenuated vaccines, you know. 
So under inactivated microorganism vaccine, you got examples in now polio, influenza, cholera, hepatitis, plague. So all these belong to inactivated microorganism vaccine, where the microorganisms are collected from the host, you know, they are killed outright. Later on, the dead microorganisms are given to the human being in the form of a, an antigen or a vaccine to introduce the form, to induce the formation of antibodies, you know. Then third category is toxoid vaccines, you know. Toxoid vaccines. In these toxoids, you know, the microorganisms you know, that cause various disorders, they secrete certain chemicals called ecotoxins. Ecotoxins as such they are virulent and these ecotoxins which are virulent are converted into non-virulent exotoxins, non-virulent exotoxins. These non-virulent exotoxins are also called toxoids. These toxoids are given to the human being in the form of a vaccine or inoculation here now. So, instead of introducing a dead microorganism or attenuated microorganism, the chemicals that are extracted from the microorganisms are given to the human being, given to the infant in the form of a vaccine. It is called toxide vaccine or inoculation here now. Under this diphtheria and tetanus and rabies belong to this kind of category here now. And uh, of late, most of the vaccines are prepared by using the principles of RDNA technology. You call them RDNA vaccines, you know. RDNA vaccines. Because collect the collection of microorganisms, you know, making them inactive or killing them, then introducing them into the human being in the form of an antigen. It is a laborious process, you know, to avoid this. Of late, in most of the pharmaceutical industries, you know, the vaccines are being prepared by using principles of RDNA technology, where they collect a small genome of the microorganism, you know. That genome is introduced into the host, introduced into the host with the help of a vector, which in turn synthesizes product of your interest, you know. That product is extracted from the host. It is processed and used as a vaccine which is called RDNA vaccine here now. So, most of the vaccines available in the market here now are of RDNA type here now. Then this juncture, I would like to say one more important point dear students here now. The polio vaccine for the first time it was invented by Salk. Salk introduced intravenous polio vaccine. Salk introduced intravenous polio vaccine. Oral polio vaccine which is being given nowadays you know twice a year that oral polio vaccine oral polio vaccine was invented by Sabin. Oral polio vaccine was invented by Sabin here now. Salk introduced or invented here now uh, the intravenous polio vaccine here now and oral polio vaccine was invented by Sabin here now. ELISA test, you know. Enzyme linked immunosorbent assay. It is a tool used in the uh, various diagnostic labs, you know, to diagnose various disorders, you know. It is used to diagnose various disorders like uh, AIDS, hepatitis, pregnancy, various STD disorders, STD disorders, thyroid disorders. All these can be diagnosed here now. AIDS, hepatitis, pregnancy. STD, thyroid is all this can be diagnosed you know by using a method called ELISA enzyme linked immunosorbent assay you know. For this you require certain material here now. The material required for the ELISA are number one ELISA meter, 
it is also called ELISA plate ok it is also called micro titer plate with uh, about 74 wells ok this micro titer plate or ELISA plate it contains certain depressions known as wells you know ok so this is the the main prerequisite for the ELISA test. Number 1, it requires purified primary antibodies to detect the antigens. Number 3, purified secondary antibodies to carry enzyme to carry enzyme you know purified secondary antibodies. Next you require a coat that is after adding an antigen or antibody the uncovered part of the micro titer plate is smeared with the coat, coat solution here now mostly serum albumin or casein is used as a coat to cover the uncovered part of micro titer plate. The next you require enzymes. The enzymes that are required are peroxidase, alkaline phosphatase, or beta galactosidase. So, peroxidase, alkaline phosphatase, beta galactosidase are the enzymes which are mostly used in the okay, ELISA test you know. The next you need to have chromogenic substrate. Chromogenic substrates like uh, orthophenylene diamine orthophenylene diamine or 5 amino salicylic acid phi amino salicylic acid Okay, both of them are used as chromogenic substrates you now which upon reacting with the enzyme they give color and the color is red by using a spectrophotometer. The color is red by using a spectrophotometer you now. Apart from this wash fluid is also used to drain out Wash fluid is also used to drain out the unbound antigens or antibodies you know. So, these are all these materials are required to execute the ELISA test here you now. The ELISA is of two types you know, direct and indirect. Direct method is used to detect the antigen of your interest. Indirect method is used to detect the antibody of therapeutic value. Now, first we shall talk about the direct ELISA method. The direct ELISA is used to detect the antigen of your interest or antigen of therapeutic value. Now, this direct is of two types you know sandwich ELISA and competitive ELISA. Now, we shall talk about first sandwich ELISA. In the sandwich ELISA here now, first you take a micro titer plate, the primary antibodies, purified primary antibodies here now, mostly monoclonal antibodies are used as primary or secondary antibodies. So, primary antibody is made to adsorb on micro titer plate. The primary antibody is made to adsorb that is made to stick to the wells of the micro titer plate. Then 
coat coat fluid is used to cover uncovered parts uncovered wells so if we take the microtiter plate it may contain nearly 74 wells in now when the primary antibody is added here you now all the wells may not get filled with the primary antibody as a result the antigen of your interest it may go waste it may go and occupy the wells where there are no primary antibodies here you now so to avoid that here you now the uncovered wells are covered with using coat i have made a mention already serum albumin or casein is used as a coat fluid here you now so coat fluid is used afterwards the antigen of your interest that is the antigen collected from the patient may be antigen collected from the hiv patient or antigen collected from okay then uh, a measles patient or antigen collected from okay hepatitis patient you know that antigen antigenic fluid is added here you now now in case that fluid which is collected the blood that is collected from the patient you know in case it contains antigen the antigen goes and uh, attaches to the primary antibodies you know then later on a purified secondary antibody tagged with an enzyme is added you know after adding the antigenic solution the purified secondary antibody monoclonal antibody tagged with an enzyme is added you know So when secondary antibody is added here now, the antigen gets sandwiched between the bottom primary antibody and the top secondary antibody. That's why it is known as sandwich ELISA here now. Okay. Then afterwards here now, chromogenic substance is added. Chromogenic substance is added. Okay. When chromogenic substance may be ortho phenylene diamine. or 5 amino salicylic acid one of them is used as a chromogenic substance substrate is added when substrate is added here now okay it if it gives yellow color if yellow color is noticed here now it indicates the presence of antigen presence of antigen if no color is observed it indicates absence of antigen that is in case the sample what you have collected from the patient in case that particular sample contains the antigen viral antigen or bacterial antigen whatever okay that antigen goes and sticks to the primary antibody the later on when secondary antibody is added here now that antigen gets stuck between the primary antibody and secondary antibody secondary antibody carries an enzyme here now so when substrate is added that enzyme reacts with the substrate and thereby gives color when it is read in electro spectrophotometer elisa meter or spectrophotometer here now if the solution which is collected from the patient if it does not contain any antigen here now when the wash fluid is added here now the uh, the blood that is collected from the patient and the secondary antibody both of them get washed away so when the chromogenic substance is added due to the absence of secondary antibody no color appears you know so if there is no color red in the spectrophotometer it indicates absence of antigen that is the sample which is added here if this particular sample does not contain any antigen of the pathogen here now when the wash fluid is added okay this uh, antigenic sample the sample collected from the patient and secondary antibody both of them get washed away so when the chromogenic substance is added no enzymatic reaction takes place consequently no color is observed here now so by noticing the color it is confirmed that the patient has an antigen of either virus or the bacterium here now so this is called sandwich elisa here now sandwich elisa is executed in case the antigen of your interest should be multivalent that is it should have minimum two epitopes so that it can combine with both the antibodies here now primary antibody as well as secondary antibody that is one disadvantage another disadvantage is you need to have a match pair of antibodies you know 
both the antibody which are used in this test should be compatible you know when match pair antibodies are not available or if the antigen of your interest is not multivalent not having more than one epitope and this method cannot be executed you know so of that you should go for competitive elisa so sandwich elisa is executed only when the antigen of your interest should be multivalent with minimum two epitopes and send uh, the match pair or compatible antibody should be available for the experiment to take off so when they are not available here now then you should go for competitive elisa you know now competitive elisa is mostly used to detect pregnancy in the human being you know human pregnancy can be easily confirm by using competitive elisa now how is it carried out i shall tell you now here you need to take the micro titer plate containing 74 wells you know a purified primary antibody purified primary antibody is adsorbed to the micro titer plate containing 74 wells later on the coat fluid is used to uncover the to cover the uncovered part of the micro titer plate then later on this sample either blood or urine of pregnant women is added so in in order to confirm pregnancy here now blood or urine from the women is collected and that is added here now the next uh, fourth step here now purified hcg human choriano gonadotrophin purified hcg tagged with an enzyme is added purified hcg tagged with an enzyme is added here now then later on substrate chromogenic substrate is added chromogenic substrate is added here now now when the chromogenic substrate is added the color is red by using spectrophotometer now here why is it called competitive elisa the blood or a urine of the pregnant women in case it contains hcg in case it contains hcg human choriana gonadotrophin that hcg it reacts with the primary antibody here now okay now when the purified hcg sample is added there will be competition between the hcg of the urine sample and the purified hcg in case this urine contains abundant amount of hcg here now that hcg reacts with the primary antibody then when wash fluid is added here now the purified hcg which is later on used gets washed away so that no color is obtained when the chromogenic substance is added here now because when this purified hcg tagged with an enzyme when it gets washed away so when the chromogenic substance is added here now there is no enzymatic reaction so no color is observed if no color is observed it indicates confirmation of pregnancy if no color is observed it indicates confirmation of pregnancy that is when the blood or urine of a woman in case it contains abundant amount of hcg that hcg goes and combines with the primary antibody that is all the paratopes of the primary antibody are completely filled with the are completely filled with the hcg of the pregnant women here now so there is no room for the, the purified hcg to occupy as a result of that when wash fluid is added 
the entire purified HCG gets washed away along with the enzyme. So, the no color is observed here. In case the blood that is collected or urine that is collected from the woman does not contain HCG here now. When second time purified HCG is added, this HCG goes and combines with the primary antibody, occupies all the paratopes of the primary antibody. When substrate is added, since the enzyme is intact, that enzyme reacts with the substrate and thereby gives color. So, if uh, color is observed, it indicates no pregnancy here. So, if the color is noticed, intense color is noted, it indicates no pregnancy. If there is no color, it indicates confirmation of pregnancy. You know. Like that, the competitive LSI is used to confirm pregnancy in the human being. You know. Now, we shall talk about the indirect ELISA. Indirect ELISA is used to detect antibodies of your interest. He is used to detect the antibodies of therapeutic value. Okay, then how is this executed here now? Here, first a purified antigen is adsorbed to the micro titer plate. A purified antigen is adsorbed to the micro titer plate. Then anti serum containing primary antibodies of the patient is added. The anti serum is collected from the patient here now. That anti serum it contains purified primary antibody, it is added to the micro titer plate. Then coat fluid is added. After adding the antigen itself to cover the uncovered uh, wells, you know, the coat fluid is added so that the anti serum, in case it contains primary antibody, it goes and sticks to the antigen, the epitopes of the antigen. Then later on, anti HISG tagged with an enzyme. is added human anti human immune serum globulin anti human immune serum globulin now this is prepared in the lab here now this also this contains secondary antibodies you know this contains secondary antibodies it is added to the test sample here now. Later on, substrate is added and color is red by using spectrophotometer. Here, yeah, I shall repeat once again antigen is adsorbed to the micro titer plate. So, it goes and sticks to the, the wells of the micro titer plate. Then unoccupied wells are filled with the coat fluid. Later on anti serum collected from the patient is added. Then later on anti HISG that is anti human immune serum globulin tagged with an enzyme is added. Substrate is added then color is red here now. So, in case this anti serum contains primary antibodies may be the anti serum of the AIDS patient here now. In case it contains the antibodies that are synthesized against the AIDS virus, in case it contains those antibodies, these antibodies will go and occupy the epitopes of the antigen and when anti HISG tagged with an enzyme is added, this in turn goes and sticks to the primary antibodies because this is considered as secondary antibody. Secondary antibody will get attached to the primary antibody. When chromogenic substance is added here now, since the enzyme is intact, that enzyme reacts with the substrate and thereby gives color here now. So, if the color is found, if the color is red here now, color is 
red in the spectrophotometer or if it is detected it indicates indicates that the person is HIV positive okay if the color is detected indicates that the person is HIV positive in case the anti serum contains primary antibodies primary antibodies will stick to the antigen when the secondary antibody tagged with an enzyme is added secondary antibody will stick to the primary antibody when chromogenic substrate is added here now the enzyme of the secondary antibody reacts with the substrate and thereby gives color so if the color is found it indicates that the person is HIV positive and if the color is not found color is not red in the spectrophotometer it indicates that the person is HIV negative you know that is in case this anti serum collected from the patient if it does not contain any antibodies you know okay then after adding that if anti HISG is added after that when you add washed fluid here now since this is not present this primary antibody is not present here now okay the anti serum that is the only the blood plasma without any antibodies and anti HISG both of them get washed away when the washed fluid is added so when the chromogenic substrate is added here now since there is no enzyme there is no enzymatic reaction so that no color is observed so if the no color is observed it indicates absence of HIV antibodies and if the color is found it indicates HIV presence of antibodies against HIV virus you know like that the indirect method is used to detect the antibodies direct method is used to detect the antigens. Now this electroencephalograph is an instrument here now it is used to find out various abnormalities of the brain here now it contains several leads here now all those leads are placed over the scalp region and they are in turn connected to a monitor here now and basing on the different types of waves that are noticed in the monitor you can find out the various abnormalities of the central nervous system here now. Now is when the monitor is uh, when the uh, graph that is obtained from this that is electrocardiogram okay electrocardiogram electroencephalogram electroencephalogram is observed here now it uh, gives you various uh, graph like illustrations here now on the basis of this the condition of the central nervous system can be easily diagnosed here now in this basically here now you have synchronized waves and desynchronized waves you know okay like alpha waves are noticed in the electroencephalogram here now when the patient or when the person is drowsy, sleepy with closed eyes, when the person is drowsy or sleepy with closed eyes, you know, in the electroencephalogram, okay, alpha waves are noticed, you know. Beta waves are noticed when the person is mentally very active or mentally tensed when the person is mentally active or mentally tensed you know beta waves are noticed you know okay delta waves are noticed delta waves are noticed in children in awakened condition Delta waves are noticed in children in awakened condition and in adults in sleeping condition. You know. And they are also noticed in adults in awakened condition when the adults are in awakened condition, in adults they are noticed. When they have certain abnormalities like brain tumors or epilepsy or mental depression. 
So these delta waves are mostly noticed in children when they are in awake condition here now. They are noticed in adults in sleeping condition. In adults, if they are noticed in awakened condition, it is an indication that the person may be suffering from brain tumor or he may be suffering from epilepsy or he may be having mental depression, either neurosis or psychosis, you know. Then theta waves are noticed in children below 5 years. Theta waves are noticed in children below 5 years. Sometimes they are noticed even in adults also. In adults they are noticed when they are subjected to mental stress. When they are subjected to mental stress, you know, even adults they are noticed. You know. So, on the basis of these waves, you know, the condition of the central nervous system can be easily studied, you know, called EEG, electroencephalograph. Now, X-rays, you know, they were discovered by Rongen. Now, these X-rays, you know, are used in the medical field to diagnose various disorders. When the X-rays are made to pass to the human body, like soft tissues present in the human body, you know, they facilitate refraction of X-rays, you know, and most of the top soft tissues appear greyish in the X-ray graph, you know, and bones, you know, they absorb X-rays, that's why they appear slightly whitish, you know. In case there is a calcification in the soft tissues or in the bones, you know, even the calcification part of the body also appears whitish. In case there are air spaces, you know, they appear slightly dark, you know. In case there are hemorrhages in the lungs, you know, even they appear slightly whitish, you know. So, by detecting those uh, different color pattern, you know, in the X-ray film, you can find out various abnormalities you know. Now, the x-rays are mostly used to find out skeletal fractures the easiest and the simplest method of diagnostic procedure you know used to find out various diagnostic disorders you know in the human body. So, skeletal fractures can be easily diagnosed by means of x-ray. Then uh, lung cancer, pulmonary edema, pneumonia, tuberculosis. The lung disorders like tumors in the lung, pulmonary edema, pneumonia and TB can be easily diagnosed by observing the x-rays you know. Then apart from this, perforations in visceral organs can be easily diagnosed by using x-rays. Then ascites that is fluid is filled spaces, fluid filled spaces ascites can be easily observed by using x-rays. Then apart from this ileus or stenosis of gut that is blockage of different parts of elementary canal can be absorbed by using x-rays you know. So, undoubtedly x-rays you know is the simplest procedure here now an easy procedure to find out various abnormalities, but however the disadvantage with this is since it is an invasive method here now it may cause chromosomal abnormalities ok if the person is subjected to x-rays you know frequently x-ray technique you know frequently you know. Apart from this, the minute details of the affected organ cannot be absorbed by x-rays, you know, because there is a superimposition of the images from dorsal to ventral and vice versa. So, this is another method of diagnostic procedure that is CT scanning or CAT scanning, you know, computed tomographic scanning or computed axial tomographic scanning. In this method, you get uh, uh, 
uh, 2D views of various affected organs in now, two dimensional views of affected organs where the disease can be easily diagnosed and uh, in a better way than the x-rays here now where the minute details of the affected organ also can be observed here now. This is used mostly to find out the trauma of the skull that is skull fractures and all that can be easily observed. Okay. Then apart from this, it is also observed uh, to find out hemorrhages in the brain and clots in the brain here now. Clots and hemorrhages in the brain can be easily observed by CAT scanning, computed tomographic scanning or computed axial tomographic scanning. It is also used here now to evaluate osteoporosis. It is also used to study various internal organs. To study the condition of various internal organs like liver, pancreas, then uh, elementary canal, then kidneys, then ovaries, then testes, okay, abdominal scanning. So, the condition of various organs, the efficiency of the various organs can be easily studied here now by using CAT scanning here now. Then apart from this, it is also study, used here now to study the vertebral disorders of the vertebral column that is lumbar spondylitis, cervical spondylitis, the extent of the damage here now, then prolapse of the intervertebral discs here now, all those can be studied here now by CAT scanning here now. So, where you mostly get 2D images of various parts of the body here now. Magnetic resonance imaging here now, which is more advanced and sophisticated than CAT scanning here now, where the protons of the body are used as a tool here now to find out the extent of various infections in the different parts of the body here now. So, magnetic resonance imaging, it contains a huge donut shaped medicine ma ma machine where the patient is sent into the machine here now, making him lie down on a flat form here now. So, various disorders of the brain and different parts of the body can be diagnosed by using MRI scanning, magnetic resonance imaging here now. Now, this is used to find out aneurysm, brain stroke, hemorrhages, clots in the brain. Okay. Brain stroke that is CVA, cerebral vascular accidents, cerebral vascular accident, they can be found out easily. Aneurysm that is thinning of the blood vessels and slightly dilation of the blood vessels in now of the brain that can be noticed. Hemorrhages, rupture of blood vessels within the brain and bleeding in the brain can be noticed. Clots in the brain can be noticed. Then even aneurysm in the heart and tearing of muscles in the heart. Heart abnormalities like cardiomegaly, okay, aneurysm in the heart here now, or valvular stenosis, okay, valvular stenosis, or valvular regurgitation, all this can be diagnosed easily by observing MRX scanning, you know, magnetic resonance imaging. You know.